This is Twit. We know. I think we know about enough about you now that we don't have to go through the whole resume. But you're a planetary scientist. You work at the SETI Institute. You started and operate the Mars Institute, and you started built with your bare hands, grit, determination, and uh, your molars. The Houghton Mars Project <laughs> molars face up on Mars. Yeah, you can just see him up there with you know like pieces of seal leather between his teeth, tying off his uh, his his tents, but. Um, you know, this this is a project that kind of sprung up out of the will, just uh, the the ground by by raw willpower, which just uh, amazes me even more having seen it. But um, well, it's remind us all what it is and what it's for. It, it's been a team effort all along. But the Houghton Mars project is a field research project. We go up to this godforsaken place every summer, uh, Devon Island, the largest uninhabited island on Earth. It's about the size of uh, Croatia or West Virginia. It's even less populated than West Virginia. <laughs> oh, there's a bunch of jokes that are just waiting to circle around, but please, please go ahead. I'm going to control myself. Yeah. And uh, I love West Virginia. It's beautiful. It's got radio telescopes. Uh, yeah. But uh, Devon Island, uh, on top of that, has a meteorite impact crater, Halton Crater. It's 23 million years old. It's 20 kilometers in diameter. And just to give you a sense, a uh, meteor crater in Arizona is only 1.2 kilometers in diameter, you know, 0.8 miles. This this thing is a 20 kilometer impact structure, uh, and it's relatively recent. And it is beautifully preserved in this Arctic freezer uh, on Devon Island, to the point where if it were smoldering, we would we would you could think that the impact just happened. But mm -hmm. of course, it's not smoldering anymore. Uh, it's 23 million years old. Uh, but it's very well preserved. And so we have just there, you know, if I were to describe Devon Island, I sometimes say this, it's a, it's a barren, rocky, cold, dry, unvegetated, UV drenched, uh, ground ice rich, impact scarred uh, wasteland. Piece, of, piece of wasteland. And uh, Ooh, sign, you might sign, have thought, sign me up for my next vacation. I think you might have thought I just described Mars, but I've actually just described Devon Island or vice versa. So it's to the point where there's even a whole conspiracy uh, sort of theory out there that, you know, where people think that NASA's never been to Mars, but does all this <laughs> Mars work on Devon Island, <laughs> which is to some extent almost a compliment to how good an analog yeah. this place is. But it's not. Of course, NASA does go to Mars, and Devon is just. Uh, a good analog for for it uh, but I've been going up there for the past 25 years and this particular summer was our 25th consecutive well 25th uh, summer field campaign on Devon Island oh this, happy anniversary yeah thank you for this project and that's longer than I was married no oh, sorry <laughs> uh, what, what else to say and you know every year we have two parts of the program. There's a science program where we do geology, biology, and we try to draw comparisons with Mars and more implications for Mars, mostly, and then the moon as well. And then the other part of the program is exploration, where we're learning how to explore. Uh, we're testing hardware, robotic rovers, Mars airplanes, spacesuits, drills. So this year we tested a next-gen spacesuit and some technologies that go along with it, and also a robotic drill. Do you call dibs on the spacesuits, Pascal, when you go? It's like, oh, well, if, if anyone's going to try it, it's going to be me, right? Oh, the whole purpose of bringing it to this location, as opposed to doing your tests in a parking lot, is precisely to put people who do field geology in it, or field exploration work in general, and put it through the the emotions of, of being really engaged in scientific field work. It's mm -hmm. only then that you can really see to what extent your spacesuit is adequate or not in terms of its design. Uh, this year, the, the focus wasn't uh, technically on the uh, sp spacesuit structure itself. It was more on the IT system mm -hmm. that uh, Collins Aerospace, who's, who's our, uh, our industry collaborator, and partner who are coming up there to do their their spacesuit tests every year with us. Collins is innovating uh, and 
you know, proposing some new IT technologies inside the suits. Suits, people might not know this, uh, spacesuits historically have been relatively poor in terms of their computing capabilities, especially the electronics inside. And that's because in a pure oxygen environment of your suit, there's been a lot of reluctance from NASA and the astronaut office and everybody who does suits to to have any chance of an electrical fire inside your suit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so computers, head up displays, things like that have traditionally not been included in suits. But now the technology has achieved enough maturity, computers that is, they're very stable. We understand how batteries operate. Uh, it is now time for, and then of course you can power thing with, things with very low voltage and amperages. So all of this combines to make the time ripe for, for there to be now IT systems inside the suit. And so we were uh, testing out for Collins as we were going about our field geology uh, we were providing feedback on various options for IT systems inside the suit, uh, so, inside and outside, I should say. And can you expand a little bit what that looks like? I mean, are we talking a heads-up display inside the helmet or something? There, there are head-up displays. There are, uh, you know, uh, visual aids. Uh, I, I don't want to comment on the specifics of the tech because mm -hmm. that's uh, something that we help Collins protect as a as something mm -hmm. that's prior. Uh, proprietary for them, but suffice it to say that there was a range of options that were being examined and uh, some displays I think are more optimal for some applications, other displays, you know, for others, uh, ultimately we'll have to probably come up with some compromise that works uh, the best for all the anticipated applications we have. So applications may include navigating, displaying maps, figuring out where you are, where you want to go, have your you know, on foot or rover traverse planned out for you ahead of you. Uh, and that's of course an unpressurized rover because you'd be in a spacesuit. Uh, or uh, things like flying a, a robot, you know, a drone for example, and, and how would how would the imaging then of the drone be displayed inside inside the, the suit, you know, while yeah. you're operating that. So so there's a even, range of things, yeah. I was gonna say like even even just main like like monitoring the suit itself. Now they use that super fancy technology called a mirror to look to look at their gauges yeah. on their chest, right? So, yeah. So you could you could imagine all of that. So I'm just saying, you know, uh, Pascal, that if I had a, a spacesuit to test, I'd be wearing the spacesuit right now. Uh, I'd be wearing it at dinner. I'd be wearing it outside. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't just use it for for uh, uh, scientific tests itself. But uh, <laughs> I I actually have an older generation uh, Collins suit. Yeah, that we tested in the Arctic in my uh, office. Oh, he's going to show us. Rod, he's going to show us. You want to see it? <laughs> yeah, let's take a little walk here. So for those of you not watching video, we're taking a stroll through Pascal's domain, and we're going to go visit his original spacesuit, which is a pretty cool moment. So, And if, if a, memory serves, right, Rod Collins has a NASA contract for spacesuits for Artemis, yeah, too. Yeah, uh, both Axiom and Collins have NASA contracts for the Artemis uh, program spacesuits. These are spacesuits for either the lunar surface and or uh, the new spacesuit for the space station and gateway. Uh, so it's uh, it's still a competitive environment between Axiom and Collins, but at the same time, uh, everybody's sort of working towards the same goal, which is to support the, the, the Artemis program. This is actually not an Artemis suit. This is a, a an older prototype of a rear entry suit. Uh, with a that that fits on a suit port so it's one of those things that you would don and doff uh by by um by climbing into it directly from the inside of a habitat or right. a rover oh. a pressurized rover and so you see the backpack swings open like a refrigerator door and you would then climb in your legs first and then you insert your arms through these uh holes i i don't have the arms here of course or or the legs hmm. and then once you're inside you you or a mechanism closes the backpack uh, behind you. And now you're sealed inside your your spacesuit. That is so, so cool. Anyway. <laughs> I, was, I was so envious of uh, our young lad who got to test the one you have up north up there last summer. And I remember looking at it thinking, maybe I could fit in it. No, there's no way. Uh, I just 
my diameter is just a little too large in the wrong places, but maybe one of these summers I'll be thin enough to sneak into one of your suits. Yeah, well, um, I keep I keep telling them to make a suit that's a little larger, uh, <laughs> even for myself. But yeah. uh, but we actually all got to try this year's suits. There were okay. two, uh, and. Uh, and the suit that you saw, Rod, is being flown back south here for the HMP Museum. Uh, and then we, we are keeping another suit up there, which we call Carl. The one that's being shipped is called Carl. Dave. <laughs> uh, the one that's up there is called Carl. And so then, is Dave uh, after Dave Bowman from 2001? That works. Uh, it's actually after... <laughs> yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> an engineer at Collins, but that works. Oh. Uh, uh, and then... And I'm presuming Carl is after Dr. Sagan, correct? Uh, Carl, Carl is in part after Dr. Sagan and also uh, Carl's Jr., where we all gathered. <laughs> where we all gathered after the first suit test uh, in Oregon a couple years ago. And then this one that I have in my lab is called Ed. So it's E-D-C. So Carl is the one we are keeping up in on Devon Island right now. And then the more advanced suit that we tested also this summer was was Bravo. We don't have a name for it yet, um, but the one I just showed you is Ed. That's named after Ed Hodgson, who was uh, a pioneering uh, engineer at uh, Hamilton Sunstrand, which is now Collins Aerospace. Ed just retired. He's still around, but uh, we wanted to honor him with uh, naming our suit after him. Well, for Bravo, how about Biff <laughs> for Back to the Future? Let's just keep it simple. Yeah. Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. ACI's new cyber skills is training for everyone on your team. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners will receive at least 20% off or as much as 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution plan. The discount based on the size of your team when you fill out the form. 